not only overshoot, but here you have a big mess. You see, it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes to where it needs to be, which starts to explain to you what kind of mess you have in the body when you have jet lag. And the, what the model is suggesting is that um, there's some peripheral component that instead of going directly after the SCN, they go around. So some go straight and some go in the other part, and it depends on the number of hours that is dependent on that. Like liver is one of the problematic ones uh, over treatment. So um, we just made a very funny simulation, and we say, let's say you travel from Europe to the United States. So if you started here, you were day and night, then you had a very short flight with a very short night, and then you already moved to the United States. So that's what will happen to your different oscillators with different features. And if you want to be nicer to your oscillators, you have to find a special light flight that will take two days and will give you, that was kind of the optimization that the computer find, that will give you all kinds of problems. So one explanation of that is if you come from Europe and you want to come to Alaska, you have to stop in Washington DC on your way and spend there one day and visit. Me. So that's one. One option. Okay, so this is uh, the reason that I wanted to show it is not because there is something particularly only on the on the SCN. This is like the easy part, and that's why we took it. But there is all these dynamical systems that are related to each other and together run the whole story. So we mentioned the subsymbolic to symbolic as a computational property. We mentioned dynamical system as a different type of computational property, and I want to mention the never stop learning computational property. And this is a very optimistic and positive view about life. So, you know, during, I think, maybe was a little melancholic. No, he just was in 36. It was a bad time to live. And he, he was, um, you know, simulating the human calculators and had this great idea that we all went after, which said, take a loadable program, give it to the machine, put memory on the side, and after you load the program, everything will work for you. But in reality, if you think about us, we usually don't only load the program and go to sleep. Okay, so we, are, we do have our genes, we do have our DNA, but we continue learning. There are many options to do. And what happened in the field of machine learning or AI in general, we took the AI, they took the Turing a little bit forward. So the old AI, we had only loadable programs. So this was all the work from the 70s and then 80s. Then, in machine learning, what we did, we preparing um, data sets, and we learn them here. So we load the programs, which can be neural networks, all kinds of things. Then we prepare data set and we learn them here. And then once we're ready, we freeze the machine and we execute it. So that's what we see in Facebook, that's what we see in Google, and that's what we see in safe driving cars. We learn, 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 until we're ready, and then we stop learning. Um, nature does not do that. Um, nature kind of forces us to continue to learn all the time. So the idea is that brain, you cannot think about it, is a loadable program and that's it. So we have to think of something better. And today actually in this group particularly, we all know that once we continue <coughs> to learn, we have a continuum of hierarchy that will give you better and better or stronger and stronger computational power if you have capability to take the input and learn it better and better. And this was not, uh, you know, such a news. Actually, um, Turing, already as a youngster, argued with his peers that um, the brain is doing that, and there should be machines that is doing that. And he was telling everybody that the electronic computer are working in discipline, but unintelligent man and suggested that there will be such machines that will be working like human minds, suggested his type of neural networks. So in general, um, I'll not talk much more about this because this is going to, this was a um, some, some type of marketing for you to come for the Wednesday when we're talking about funding agency because what we do now is try to collect a group of people that work together of how we can think of of modeling AI neural networks that continue to learn real, not online with the same assumption of distribution, but really continue further. So let's put it all together. 
um, we can think about computation in brain or computation in body more like it's dynamical systems and think about it as dynamical diseases as many people talk or maybe to be more optimistic and think about dynamical health. So when you have mutated genes or any changes, the organs do not work exactly as they do. Or maybe when you age, when we age, it's not working exactly as it worked before. But we can write it as a dynamical system and perhaps the details of what happened are less important than the dynamic themselves. So if you can think about it, if you can change the dynamic without changing the cause, perhaps this is enough. And perhaps, you know, cognitively, going back to the abstraction hierarchy, perhaps even if we are in different cognitive time of our life, or you under stress, maybe there are ways that we can still work in the same order of hierarchy as we need to do. And the dynamical health hypothesis with that I finished my talk with is that restoring system dynamics to balance ranges is something that has happened through life. And this is the online continuous learning. This is the sub-symbolic to symbolic because we do it at all levels. And this is the dynamical behavior. This is more like the way that nature does its own computation. So with this, I want to thank you very much. And I actually have a uh, strong voice, so uh, thank you very much for this lovely talk. Um, I think we all like to think that with the deep networks that we uh, go from a you know, low-level representation to a high-level representation. On the other hand, what I found stunning that you found uh, that we have all the like, game playing, so you, you, you find very early uh, activity, um, which is very sensory-driven, but still requires high-level tasks. And on the high end, you have the Posner task, which is actually fairly simple task, but it requires actually endogenous uh, rather than exogenous. So, so maybe you showed actually much more that it is rather than we should think in hierarchy, and maybe when we have the recurrent networks, we should anyhow think about this differently, that it is much more exogenous versus endogenous. Thank you. That's, that's a good point. Thank you. <coughs> Well, thank you very much for, for this interesting talk, sorry. Um, so I think it's also good to know that some of, this, uh, uh, some of these problems have been looked at in the machine learning community, mm -hmm. not in neural networks, mm -hmm. but in the classical. Yeah. So there's a 10-year-old paper by Tom Mitchell uh, that looked, you may be aware of that, mm -hmm. that he looked at the MRI data and he found that some of the relationships are for consistent what? with for what? Language. Huh? Yeah, he did it for language. Yeah, but the point is that he looked at relationships in WordNet, which yeah. are exactly about abstraction. Yeah. And he also has a five-year-old work now that's still running on never-ending learning. Where yes, his never-ending learning is a bit different, and also he's uh, so he has, he's a great researcher, and I really enjoy you know the different type of his talk. There are some differences, and let me uh, let me uh, know them. So in the in the language domain, he's talking a little bit about. Uh, words that in some way are more complex. The, the notion of abstraction is a bit different for him. And in his lifelong learning, or in general lifelong learning, or lifelong machine learning that is now, does not have to assume that there is changing or surprises. What he's actually doing is learning over the internet from the same uh, distribution. So he continues gaining more and more from the same distribution. This is more like an online learning, which he calls lifelong. But it's, it's a great work. There was a question also in the back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so maybe I'll first there and then I'll come back. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I cannot hear you. This is a lecture deals with biological motivations. Can you give me your opinion about the biological function of sleep? Biological function of? Biological function of sleep. Why do biological you sleep? function of sleep. Yes. Oh, this is much above me. <laughs> I say this is much above me. I mean, there are theories that are talking about consolidation during sleep. There are uh, 
there are uh, theories that are talking about regeneration and energy maintenance, and the, one of the capabilities that we're able to do so many things with social energy. Uh, do you not hear you? Yeah. So I hope so energy. Uh, you can use the podium mic. Is it better now? Yeah. OK, so I say, Understanding sleep is far, far above me. Uh, there, there are many theories going all the way from uh, memory consolidation, from the sleep awake, the dream wake uh, methods, going to uh, metabolism and explaining why that how we need to re rejuvenate and, and and parts needs to to uh, get better. So this is far, far beyond my understanding. Um, I, I read about it with great interest. But I'm, I'm not the person to, to explain. What are, what are the implications of all of the timing and asynchrony and randomness? Um, what are the implications on the kind of systems that people could build that are going to model the brain more precisely? Are there implications for whether conventional digital computers can do what you're talking about, or there's some extension. So you, you mentioned asynchronicity, and what was the other one? Uh, randomness and okay. the timing between the layers okay. of OK, memory. wonderful. So um, so all the, all the notion about timing. So I think in, in particular in our community, we have this neural network people that everything has to be synchronous, <coughs> and it has to be clocked. And, and these people that really think that the whole notion is to have events driven. Um, now, if you have a true event driven, then you fall theoretically beyond Turing. So theoretically, if you go to event driven, you're not within the Turing anymore. Okay? So it, uh, actually, theoretically, mathematically, there is a huge difference. Yeah. All right. So, it, yeah, it was a... Very, very nice talk. Uh, my question concerns the first part, uh, and maybe you could just uh, get that uh, slide when you have the slope, uh, maybe upward or downward. Yes, okay. Yeah, so, all right, so actually my question is uh, a little bit relates to what Alex uh, also asked that, uh, that uh, okay, so you link it to the abstraction uh, and, uh, and uh, maybe more precisely that, uh, okay, so you started that this is a linear model and this is as simple as possible and so on, so I, okay, I buy it. But, uh, but now, just looking at it, it's uh, obviously not enough. Yeah. So, and uh, what, uh, so what uh, did you thought about? Because, okay, what I see in it, this comment, that looks like that maybe first it's high and then drops and then there is some background. And yeah. if, I, if I do the other thing, then also similar. So, yeah. so okay, let's yeah. looking at my, my bad thing, so maybe a transition from a high to low or something like that. Yeah. Would, would you, how is that? So, so actually this is a very good point and this is uh, something that I think ought to be done. If you look at the different behaviors and you want to look more at the function of how they are going between the different pins, you will see that like this shape is more like at the bottom for eight of them and then two at the top if I want to be very general, while uh, this one is really kind of uh, going up and down, but really more slopey-wise. So one, one of the thoughts that I had is perhaps we can see relation between uh, cognitive uh, behaviors that are not necessarily neighbors in their slope. Perhaps there is relation between things that are, that, that are actually very different because the, the amount of early to late will be uh, not just based on slope, but based on more details will be more similar. So I think that perhaps there are properties like this. There are other reasons and there are other properties that one can look perhaps when, when a person is young versus a person that is more mature and know how to make this task, perhaps also 
there are things that are settling to different kind of behavior. So I think that looking at the details of that is actually very, very interesting. And I would ask question like looking between you know, novice and somebody who knows like a young, young person and somebody who is mature to know, looking at different, in different cognitive stages of their life, like when they start declining. And, you know, and trying to see if there are, you know, properties that are related to the cognitive situation of the person, or maybe there are relation between different, different tasks, which take some similar parts of the brain for them. So this is a very interesting question, and this ought to be done because the data is all there, and, you know, analysis we can all do here. Hama, uh, thank you for a great talk. It was very, it was really fascinating. Uh, and it turns out that my question is connected with your answer just now. So you said, uh, you know, going from uh, over a developmental uh, uh, continuum from, from, from novice to expert or from early to late. Uh, and here, obviously, you go from uh, more sensory to more abstract, uh, and you look at early and late, okay, you find the slope. Have you thought about also looking at the continuum, the uh, filers in any continuum? So, uh, so uh, in different regions of the brain appear at different stages, for example, in mammals, or in, you know, if you go at reptiles, and so if you go across vertebrates. So do you see, a, do you see some, some correspondence there as well? This is very interesting. I never thought about it until now. That, that is actually very interesting. So you would say, like, this is a very reptilish behavior of you. Right, so, <laughs> so you, would see, you would see more, uh, the emergence of more abstract behaviors in, uh, you know, with evolution. This, this is very interesting. I don't know if, if there are actually, FM, I, I'm sure there must be fMRI done on, on rodents. I mean, there's everything done to them. So, you know, it's worth looking. It's very interesting. I, I never thought about it. Of course, this is very complicated. Um, there is the dimension of lesser and higher abstraction, which certainly exists through the mouse and lower organisms. And then there is this other concept of symbolic behavior, which is also important, where you're relying more on words and logic and formal reasoning. Um, so that in addition to the front to back distinction, there is, of course, the left and right distinction. For the language. And the left and right is, is also extremely important. I have to admit, when I try to track what's going on in brains in Washington, um, it's only right. The, the difference between left brain and right brain people is just very overwhelming lately. Uh, and it, it's a big subject, that's probably all I should say for now. <laughs> so to whoever doesn't know Paul is from NSF. <laughs> uh, kind of kind of riding on what uh, Paul says. Uh, so I, uh, I was thinking about the the symbolic versus sub-symbolic representation. And, uh, I, I think the one interesting issue about this is that uh, it's very tempting to think of a finite number of symbols. And you, you could maybe even extrapolate, and if you're feeling generous, say there's a countably infinite uh, set that you can map them to the integers, for example. Uh, but you could also argue that you can make up new symbols. So you, you have the alphabet, you have the numbers, then you have Greek symbols, but you can draw your own symbols and make them up. So one could argue that actually you are dealing with an uncountable space, even when you're thinking of symbols, because somebody created those symbols. So you make your own language. Your yeah. So I think that might be a way to bridge that gap. And, and that just uh, occurred to me uh, during this talk, but it seems to me that there, there doesn't have to be this dichotomy, that there's a false dichotomy. And, and, and trying to bridge the false dichotomy uh, may be part of the answer. This is very interesting. Thank you. Um, so, um, my understanding is that basically, from, from this part of your talk, you are correlating essentially uh, the abstraction of reasoning with some with the distance from the sensory input, yeah. in a sense. Um, there is in, in the literature there is a lot of uh, thought about abstraction in terms of of the motor output. Mm -hmm. So would that somehow fit in that model? So the distance from 
from the less, the least abstract uh, part of the motor output to, uh, you know, to plans uh, for, uh, for uh, like strategies for movements or whatever. That's interesting. So I think, you know, for many people, when you think, when they think about input and output of the brain, they think about sensory, and the output is motor. So in this particular case, we kind of ignored the question of output because we were looking of thoughts. So we were just thinking about distances from where it is. And I can tell you where the motor part is along the hierarchy. So it's not in 10. So it will be low. I don't know what it means. We, we can, you can probably just kind of skew the Europeans and put the motor to be the higher and, and go back and forth and, and cut the brain in different types of pins that will be from sensory to motor, which is something we have not done it. But it's an interesting, you know, kind of a mathematic to go directly from both ways. It's, it's a good point. Okay. I have a second one, but <laughs> okay. Oh, I just wanted to mention, in addition to motor, I and mean, you probably know about the work on by people like Badre and Coquelin, however you pronounce it, and Christoph about going further forward in the prefrontal cortex, getting higher and higher levels of abstraction. Yeah. That seems like it's related to. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, what was the Enjoyed your talk, uh, especially about uh, the slope here. I have a, just a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, what I would do is uh, I would create multiple bin sizes. You know, maybe a power of two, the size of the bins. So then you would have more bins, and I would count the number of uh, uh, activations. So instead of vector of ten, you would do the vector of forty. Well, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, Size bin two, four, eight, you know, maybe diameter. So we actually scale. did it. We actually did it uh, up to five hundred and sixty-four. Yeah. But so but we, we had equal size bin. Your suggestion is different. Yeah, different size bins, and you would measure the activation per each different size bin, and then plot it on a log log basis, and that would give you the fractal dimension of this uh, behavior. And I think what you could do is you can classify different behaviors. Their fractal dimension based on this map. Thank you. This is cool. Come after the talk, maybe you can do that. 